Adding workshop functionality to a game is something that I've wanted to do for a long time. I dreamt of doing it with my first game and every project since then. But there always seems to be too many potential problems, and the biggest two, at least as far as I can see, are that not only do you have to create the tools that make the content, you have to create the framework to handle that content. Now, while that might sound easy, I don't think it is, at least for most games. The second issue is that documentation on how to implement the workshop functionality is scarce, really scarce. At least from my searches, I found almost nothing. Now, I think I've got a solution to the first problem, and I'm hoping this video and the accompanying blog post start to chip away at the second problem. But before we dive into the code and my solution, I want to take a step back. The main goal of this video is to give an example of how I implemented the Steam Workshop with my game, Where's My Lunch, and not to give a step-by-step -step process for you to follow exactly. I don't even think that's possible since every game is so different. I'm going to try to talk about the big ideas that I think every game will need to deal with and point out the problems that I had along the way. I'll look at how to upload, download, and update your workshop items. I'm not going to look at how to handle the data and the files you might be uploading and downloading inside of your project, as that's 100% dependent on the type of files and how they're being used in your individual project. With Where's My Lunch, it was easy to figure out the type of content. It's levels. Players can create and share new levels. And I already had a sandbox level built into the game. So turning that into a full-fledged level editor shouldn't really be that much of a stretch. In an earlier video, I explained how I'm using EasySave to save all the data from levels and store it as an external file. It's surprisingly simple, even easy. And it's this file that my game will upload and download. Okay, so with the type of content, a simple singular external file, and EasySave handling that file, the first problem is largely solved. The second problem, which is a lack of documentation, was on the surface seemingly solved by using FacePunch Steamworks. Well, sort of yes and sort of no. FacePunch provides some code snippets for how to upload and update a workshop item. And it looks pretty simple, and it is, sort of. As always, the problems lie in the details. Before we get into writing code, we need to set up the Steamworks backend. And there's not a lot that needs to get set up, but there are a few important things. And they are not covered or mentioned in the FacePunch documentation. First, we need to enable UGC file transfer, which is done with a single toggle. Easy, done, got it. Next, we need to set the workshop visibility. The default state will be enough for you, the developer, to upload the files, but if you want your audience to be able to test the workshop, you are going to need to do more work. For early testing, I chose the second option, which requires a custom Steam group for your testers. Anyone in that group will automatically have access to the workshop. Which option you choose is, of course, up to you and your project's needs. It's worth noting that the workshop page will not be available to testers unless your game's store page is also public. Again, I didn't find this documented, but it makes sense, and that was my experience. Then, there is one more very important step. If you are uploading images or larger files, you will need to enable Steam Cloud and increase the byte quota and the number of files per user. In the Steam Developer forums, the Valve employees seem to be in favor of raising the limits far higher than needed, which I imagine is to avoid errors and player frustration. Now, I have no idea why the default is so low or if there are any downsides to raising those limits. But if you don't change these settings, your uploads will likely fail and there will be no indication that this is the problem. I didn't hit the snag originally while uploading small save files, but once I added preview images, the uploads started to fail. And I spent hours, and I mean hours, trying to figure out the solution to this problem. So yeah, go change those settings before you get too far and too deep into your code. There are, of course, other settings for the Steam Workshop, but these are the basics that are required to get the minimum of uploading and downloading functioning. With the back end set up, it's time to get on to uploading, and this is an exciting step, and it's not a hard one, if it works. So this is the part of the video where I'm supposed to remind you that there are free Steam keys in the comments down below. Just leave a comment letting us know which key you used. Anyways, back to the video. Face Punch gives us almost no indication of the cause of problems with an upload, if there are any. So yeah, you're going to need to find some patience and be prepared to spend some time searching for solutions. You may very well hit snags that I didn't. Here you can see the upload function that I'm using. I've minimized the lines that are overly specific to my project, and I didn't think would add much clarity. To upload files, you will need a path to the folder containing all the files and assets. Whereas for the file preview image, you will need a path to the actual file that's going to be uploaded. After that, the code snippet from FacePunch shows you what you need to do. There are several parameters or options for the upload. Many of these options are not well documented, but they are named well enough to make their purpose pretty clear. For my purposes, I added a description, a few tags, and set the visibility to public. If you don't set the visibility to public, the upload can succeed, but then the item will be set to private by default. 
You may also notice that I've created a new instance of the progress class. For the most part, my version was taken straight from FacePunch with the addition of a few clumsy bits that will provide some visual feedback to the user while their files are uploading. The uploading process is asynchronous. So after the upload process has been attempted, I send a message to the console based on the results. The results don't tell you much beyond whether the upload was successful or not. And I really wish there were more clues as to why the upload may have failed. But all the same, knowing whether the upload was successful or not is still useful. That said, if the upload did fail, I display a message to the user and then invoke an event to make sure all the systems that might care about a failed upload know that it happened. If the upload is successful, it'll take a few minutes and your workshop item will appear on the game's workshop page. This is pretty sweet and honestly, it's not really all that difficult if you avoid the pitfalls. So moving on to downloading. The idea behind downloading is to do a search and then based on the results of that search, individual workshop items can be queried or downloaded. And once again, FacePunch documentation is pretty good and the process of doing a search is fairly straightforward. In my code, I search by tag and then have other optional searches that can be added by the player. The search also requires a page number. By default, I get the first page, but it's likely that you will want additional pages and you will need to handle this in your implementation. You may notice that I chose to wrap the search options in a custom class. And I did this for convenience and to reduce the number of input parameters in the class. While I included many of the possible search parameters, I didn't include all of them, but this custom class will allow me to easily add new parameters. Now, just like the upload process, the search process is asynchronous and the results will come back in a short period of time. It also has to be done in an async function and wrapped in a try catch statement. Now it's possible the search results are null and we can check the property has values to ensure or check that the search was successful. Then the results, if there are any, can be looped through with a for each loop like so. The Steamworks item type gives you access to the title, description, votes by the community, a URL to the preview image, and a whole lot more. Accessing these properties is straightforward, but once again, the handling of those values is very much dependent on your project. Here you can see my user interface for each workshop level. The buttons on the bottom right are contextual and change visibility depending on the status of the item. The actual downloading of items is quite simple. Items are downloaded by Steam ID, which is readily accessible from the Steamworks item found in the search results. These files are then downloaded into a Steam folder. Their exact location can be found with the directory property of the Steamworks item. Do note that you are not downloading a Steamworks UGC item type. You are downloading the same files that you uploaded. Now this caused some struggles on my end, as it was easy for me to think that I no longer needed reference to the Steamworks item and just work with the downloaded files. Once you lose reference to the item, there is no easy way to find it again from the downloaded files. By losing reference to the item, you lose access to lots of metadata that you're probably going to want to have later on. So tracking or keeping reference to an item is important, and many of my functions pass references to items, not to saved files. So maybe I'll show my ignorance with the Steam Workshop, but I was under the impression that I didn't need or want to subscribe to each and every level that a user might try out. In the API, downloading and subscribing are different actions, and I couldn't find anything that said you should do both. So here's me saying, I think you should do both. It keeps things simple, and it's one less thing that needs to get checked. There was some snag I hit, and to be honest, I can't remember exactly what it was now, but it was going to take a lot of work to engineer around not subscribing. So yeah, just do it. It's easy, and personally, I don't see a downside for the player or you, the developer. With uploading and downloading working, the last big hurdle with the workshop was updating items. And once again, the actual updating is pretty straightforward and is very similar to uploading. The biggest difference here is that rather than create a new community file, we are passing in the Steam ID of the item, which allows Steamworks to update the files. The one big snag that I hit is that the upload or the update will fail if the file hasn't changed. And there's no indication that this is the problem. The files just won't upload or update, which makes sense on a lot of levels, but leads me to the next issue. In Where's My Lunch, players can locally save a level and don't have to upload it, and I guess that's how most games do it too. But this means that there could be a local version and a downloaded workshop version of an item in different folders. On top of that, there's no easy way to compare those files or know if one exists and the other doesn't, and it seems to get messy in a hurry. So if a player makes changes to a level, which version should it save to? Now maybe this is obvious, but I definitely need to think about it for a while, and I think I slept on it for a night or two. I came to the conclusion that changes should always be made to the local version, and those local versions would need to get pushed to the workshop. This means that if a player downloads someone else's item, then before they can edit it, a local version needs to be saved. 
It's also unclear to me whether Steam itself checks ownership of workshop items when attempting to update them. So I created a simple internal check of the item ownership before updating. If the original item is not owned by the current player, the files are uploaded to the workshop as a new item. If the original files are owned by the player, then the files simply update. This does leave the edge case of the owner wanting to upload the files as a new item, but I'm okay with that and they can actually get around that by saving the files locally under a different name. Once players are creating and sharing levels, it's quite possible they will want to delete an item that they've uploaded. This is especially true if you are doing some testing with the workshop. And once again, it's very easy to do. One function call with the Steam ID and the item gets removed. However, the process does take some time and could cause some issues if a player refreshes the search while the item being deleted. The deleted item seems to partially still be there for up to a minute or two. For Where's My Lunch, I have the imperfect solution of turning off the UI object when a level is deleted. This gives the player some indication that the deletion is happening. But again, if they refresh the search, I don't have a system in place, or at least not yet, to not show the partial and confusing results. This is certainly something that I need to smooth out in a future build. So there you go, there's my implementation of the Steam Workshop. It works, it's not perfect, but in the big scheme of things, it's not really that complicated. The amount of code needed to upload, download, and update files is actually quite small. The bulk of my workshop code is handling the UI or controlling input and output of the upload, download, and update functions. I'm happy to share those extra bits, but they are highly dependent on the game, and I'm not sure they are particularly useful, but I could be wrong. So at the end of the day, I hope that was interesting, or better yet, useful for you and your project. And until next time, happy game designing.